Good afternoon and welcome to today's discussion, keeping insurrectionists from holding office, the potential power of section three of the 14th amendment. I'm Russ Feingold and I'm president of ACS, the country's foremost legal network with more than 250 student and lawyer chapters across the nation. Through our diverse nationwide network of progressive lawyers and law students and judges and scholars and advocates and many others, ACS's mission is to support and advocate for laws and legal systems that strengthen our democratic legitimacy, uphold the rule of law, and redress the founding failures of our constitution and the enduring inequities in our laws in pursuit of realized equality. If you aren't already, I'd encourage you to become a member of ACS. Go to acslaw.org, where you can join and find more information about events like this one. I would also like to encourage you to attend our national convention, which will be held in Washington, DC, May 18th through the 20th. The ACS convention, I can tell you, is a great opportunity to network with other progressive lawyers and law students and hear from some of the leading voices in the progressive legal movement, including featured remarks by Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison. So go to acslaw.org to learn more. Just some quick housekeeping notes before we begin. This afternoon's discussion is being recorded and the recording will be available on ACS's website after today's program concludes. For those interested in CLE credit, information is available uh, in the chat. Finally, uh, there will be time during today's discussion for audience questions. To submit a question, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Do not use the chat to ask your questions as uh, we will not be monitoring it and then your question will not be, part, will not be in, in the queue. For most of us, the attack on the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021, that left five people dead, remains a shameful and shocking reminder of how fragile our democracy can be. It was saddening and angering to see federal citizens attempting to use intimidation and violence to disrupt the peaceful transition of power. This anger and shock was compounded by reports that revealed that state and local government office holders from across the country participated in this attempted subversion of our democracy, and that some within the federal government itself played a role in fomenting, inciting, and even coordinating that attack. For those public officer hold, office holders who betrayed this country and our Constitution by participating in or supporting the January 6th insurrection, can we really trust them to be stewards of our government at the local, state, and federal level? What then are the consequences if that happens? Today, here to help us consider these questions is an exceptional group of lawyers and legal scholars who will be led by our moderator, Praveen Fernandez, Vice President of the Constitutional Accountability Center. Praveen? Thank you so much, Senator Feingold. It's great to be with you today. Um, and thank you to ACS for this valuable programming. Uh, if anyone had told me uh, when I graduated from law school in the late 90s that the Foreign Emoluments Clause and the Disqualification Clause would make up a good chunk of my professional career, I would have been incredulous. Um, and that, of course, is in part due to the fact that I would have had no idea what either of these clauses were. They certainly weren't, weren't part of my con law curriculum. They weren't part of the law review articles I was reading, and they weren't part of discussions in the mainstream media. And of course, the disqualification clause uh, was kept out of the courts, out of curricula and out of the media because at least in practical terms, compliance with political norms meant uh, that we did not need to discuss uh, the meaning of the clause. But four years after a norm shattering presidency, after a convulsive period of disrespect for the rule of law and a violent attack on the US Capitol 
motivated by an attempt to overturn the results of the presidential election has changed everything. And here we are discussing the disqualification clause, a clause uh, that was part of reconstruction amendments drafted in the wake of a civil war during a period of our history so transformative that it's often referred to as the second founding, a clause that is painfully and extremely relevant today. And to help us understand why that is, we have an amazing array of experts. And I'm just honored to be in conversation with them today. I'm gonna to give them the briefest of introductions because anything more is gonna cut into their time to speak with you. So I will start with uh, Gerard Malioka, who is the Samuel Rosen Professor at the Indiana University Robert McKinney School of Law. He is the author of four books and over 20 articles on constitutional law and intellectual property. Most importantly for today's purposes, he is the leading expert on section three of the 14th Amendment. And then of course, we're joined by Nikhil Sass, um, who serves as general counsel, as senior counsel for, um, at Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. Nikhil served on the trial team that secured the removal and disqualification of a New Mexico County Commissioner under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment for his participation in the January 6th insurrection, the first such disqualification ruling since 1869. And prior to joining Crew, Nikhil worked as a trial attorney at the Department of Justice in the Civil Division's Federal Programs Branch. We're also joined by Floyd Abrams, who is senior counsel at the New York law firm of Cahill, Gordon, and Rundell. He's argued 13 cases in the Supreme Court and has written three books about the First Amendment, the most recent of which is The Soul of the First Amendment. He has taught First Amendment courses at Yale, Columbia, and NYU law schools, taught for eight years at the Columbia School uh, Graduate School of Journalism, and he'll be teaching law again this fall at Columbia Law School. He, along with other prominent First Amendment scholars, filed an amex brief in the New Mexico case that was just referenced in Nichols' bio. And last but certainly not least, we're joined by uh, Sonia Gibson Rankin, who's Associate Professor of Law at the University of New Mexico School of Law. She's taught in the fields of torts, con law, technology and law, family law, and race and law. She's a member of the New Mexico Supreme Court Commission on Equity and Justice, and the former president of the New Mexico Black Lawyers Association. Importantly for today's purposes, uh, Professor Gibson Rankin filed a prominent amnex brief in the New Mexico case uh, on behalf of the NAACP New Mexico State Conference and the NAACP Otero County Branch. Thank you to all of you for, for being part of this conversation. So I'm gonna kick this off. Uh, let's start with you, Professor Malioka, uh, as uh, one of the leading scholars in this area. Could you give us a little background on the disqualification clause and its history? Sure, uh, thank you, Praveen. Thank you to all my panelists uh, here. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, section three was written really for two reasons. <clears throat> First, to basically prevent officials who had joined the Confederacy from returning to office and thereby sabotaging the government in a way that they had tried to do openly during the Civil War and might do surreptitiously if they returned to office after the Civil War. The second reason Section 3 was ratified was that people said, and this was a focus of attention at the time in Congress, that the people who had been government officials and had then joined the Confederacy had broken their oaths of office. They were, you might say, oath breakers, right? And so they had forfeit their right to serve in office unless they showed remorse or did things to get themselves back in the good graces of Congress. So the way Section 3 was written was to say that it applied only to former officials who had joined the Confederacy, that not all former Confederates, and that you could get a form of pardon from Congress if a supermajority in each house were to deem somebody worth giving amnesty to and allowing them to return to office. Okay, now, when this provision was ratified in 1868, there were various means of implementation that we saw in the four years or so following that. In some states that were under military reconstruction, the Union Army was in charge of enforcing Section 3. In other states that had returned to the Union, state courts were 
adjudicating claims that removed people from office. North Carolina is an example. Uh, the Houses of Congress themselves enforce Section 3 through their exclusion power. So the Senate, for example, refused to seat a member elect who had been part of the Confederacy and was, was sent to be the senator and they refused to seat him and he ultimately did not take a seat. And then finally, Congress did pass enforcement legislation in 1870 in the first Ku Klux Klan Act that provided a civil and criminal remedy for removing people from office who had not yet left office or in, and imposing criminal penalties on those who sort of willfully refused to leave office when they were ineligible. Now, in 1872, Congress exercised its power under Section 3 to grant a pretty broad amnesty to former Confederates that left out only the most senior, worst of the worsts like Jefferson Davis. Why did they do that? Basically because there was kind of a sense of maybe we should let bygones be bygones or that if we make some conciliatory gesture towards the South, there would be more cooperation in reconstruction policy. Turned out that didn't work out, but that was the idea. And pretty much after that, Section 3 became dormant. There was only one instance until recently where Section 3 was enforced, and that was by the House of Representatives during World War I when they excluded a member elect that they said had basically given aid and comfort to Germany by making a lot of speeches against World War I. Uh, and other than that, it was just a kind of historical curiosity until January 6th of 2021. So maybe I'll stop there and let Nick pick up the story. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. And uh, Nico, tell us really uh, what, what this has looked like in practice uh, as it's been litigated. You were part of this groundbreaking case. And of course there were cases uh, also in, in other states, but could you tell us a little bit about how, what this looks like in, in practice? Sure. Uh, so I, I'm happy to walk through the Coy Griffin case, and it might be helpful to uh, give some background on who uh, Coy Griffin uh, is. Uh, uh, Mr. Griffin was a county commissioner in Otero County, New Mexico. Uh, he was the founder of an advocacy group called Cowboys for Trump. Uh, and after the 2020 election, uh, he was a very uh, vocal participant in the Stop the Steal movement. Uh, he spoke at numerous rallies and protests uh, promoting the lie that the 2020 election was stolen and somehow fraudulent. Uh, and in the week uh, prior to January 6th, uh, he was a speaker on a cross-country bus tour uh, sponsored by Women for America First, a, a leading Stop the Steal rally organizer where he sort of uh, further the goal of, of mobilizing a mob to travel to D.C. for the events of January 6th. Uh, in, in each stop on this bus tour, he used increasingly violent rhetoric, uh, specifically calling on uh, men to join him in the battle and war in the streets of Washington, D.C., to make sure that uh, Vice President Pence, quote, did the right thing uh, by refusing to certify the election. Uh, and then on the 6th, uh, Mr. Griffin trespassed on the Capitol grounds and remained there for several hours. Uh, he, he did not actually breach the Capitol building, uh, and he did not physically engage in violence himself. Uh, however, he did work up the crowd, incite the crowd, and encourage those around him who were engaged in violence. And also, uh, as the testimony in our case established, his mere presence in the mob within the restricted area contributed to law enforcement uh, being overwhelmed that day. Now, we know all of this uh, because Griffin brought a videographer with him to D.C. Uh, the videographer videotaped uh, each one of his speeches on this cross-country road tour uh, to D.C. and uh, all of Mr. Griffin's actions at the Capitol that day. Uh, that evidence was used in uh, the federal criminal prosecution uh, brought against Griffin. Griffin, he was uh, charged and convicted uh, for trespassing at the Capitol, but he was uh, ultimately acquitted of uh, disorderly conduct in a, a bench trial before Judge Trevor McFadden in, in D.C. And so uh, that brings us to uh, to our case. In, in March of last year, while uh, Mr. Griffin's trial was ongoing, uh, my organization crew uh, and co-counsel filed a civil quo warranto uh, action against Mr. Griffin in state court in Santa Fe. Uh, the suit was brought on behalf of, of three New Mexico residents uh, and sought as relief uh, Mr. Griffin's removal uh, and disqualification under the 14th Amendment. Uh, 
after several months of unsuccessful litigation by Mr. Griffin to try to enjoin the state court proceedings, uh, the state court case proceeded to a two-day uh, bench trial uh, in, last August. Uh, during that trial, we put on uh, four live witnesses, uh, Officer Daniel Hodges of the D.C. Metropolitan Police Department, who defended the Capitol on January 6th, uh, photographer Nate Gowdy, who was on assignment for Rolling Stone magazine at the Capitol and took uh, hundreds of pictures uh, of Mr. Griffin and, and what he did that day. Uh, and then two experts, uh, Professor Mark Graber, uh, an expert of constitutional history uh, in the history of the 14th Amendment, uh, and Dr. Rachel Kleinfeld, uh, an expert on political violence. Uh, and also, we had some tremendous uh, amicus support by uh, the folks on, on this call, uh, and I will let I will let them uh, address what their what their uh, fantastic uh, briefs covered. Uh, so in terms of the court's ruling, uh, about a month after trial, the court entered judgment in our client's favor. Uh, in a uh, thorough uh, a decision uh, in uh, findings of fact and conclusions of law, uh, the court removed uh, Mr. Griffin from office effective immediately and barred him from life uh, from serving in, in public office. Uh, the court's ruling was notable in a few respects that I'll try to uh, run through now. Uh, as, as Praveen mentioned, it was the first court ruling since 1869, uh, disqualifying an official under uh, the 14th Amendment, uh, and it was also the first, first court ruling uh, recognizing that the January 6th attack was an insurrection uh, within the meaning of the 14th Amendment. Uh, importantly, the court ruled that the insurrection encompassed not just the attack on the Capitol, but also the preceding uh, planning, incitement, and mobilization. Uh, similarly, the court found that uh, Mr. Griffin engaged in the insurrection ba based both on his pre-January 6th uh, mob mobilization efforts, as well as his actions at the Capitol uh, on the 6th. Um, the court made clear that uh, one need not personally commit acts of violence to be disqualified, uh, and that nonviolent overt acts may count as engagement in an insurrection. Uh, and the court uh, confirmed, uh, consistent with Reconstruction era authority, that a prior criminal conviction is not a prerequisite to disqualification. Uh, and that is because Section 3 is not a criminal penalty, uh, but rather is a constitutional qualification for office uh, akin to other qualifications set forth in the Constitution. Uh, Griffin did appeal the trial court's decision, but that appeal was recently dismissed uh, by the New Mexico Supreme Court. Uh, so unless the U.S. Supreme Court takes up the case, that will be the end of the litigation. Uh, now, Praveen had mentioned uh, the other Section 3 litigation. There have been uh, a few other Section 3 cases brought by other organizations against public officials, such as uh, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, and former uh, Congressman uh, Madison Cawthorn. Uh, those cases have developed or established helpful precedents, uh, but did not result in disqualification rulings. Uh, in the Greene case, uh, the administrative law judge there uh, held that the evidence against Green was insufficient to establish that she personally engaged in an insurrection, uh, and the Cawthorn case was uh, mooted when he lost his primary election. Uh, that, that being said, uh, we believe the uh, Griffin decision affirms the continued viability of Section 3 as a mechanism to protect American democracy uh, from those who would seek to subvert the Constitution, uh, and we at CRU are uh, fully intent to pursue additional uh, disqualification challenges in the future. Thank you so much, Nikhil. And just as a footnote, uh, those voter challenges in North Carolina and in Georgia were brought uh, were brought by voters, and the the lawyers and organization there were Free Speech for People. Um, and as a as a matter of disclosure, some amicus uh, we filed amicus briefs. The Constitutional Accountability Center filed amicus briefs in in those cases. Um, thanks. That's so helpful, Nikhil. And I, I'm going to go to you now, Floyd. Uh, you know, one of the contentions made with variable levels of seriousness has been that there's something inconsistent uh, about 14.3 accountability and First Amendment protections. And the brief that you filed uh, really it addresses that uh, argument head on. And if if you could, could you could you sort of sketch out a little bit about what what your brief did in the New Mexico case? Sure. I, I should say first that. Uh... The brief was drafted and joined by really a number of the most extraordinary uh, uh, and significant, I would say, scholars, First Amendment scholars in the country, uh, Dane Shermaninsky at Berkeley, Martha Minow, Larry Tribe at Harvard, uh, uh, Professor Anjani at uh, University of Mexico Law School. Uh, I, I just mentioned a few. The brief was written in good part 
because of our concern about the very question that you raised. What, what would a judge say? How would a judge address the question of whether the First Amendment was itself being violated uh, by the argument would be punishing, sanctioning uh, someone for primarily engaging in speech. Um, and it was our thought that it would be potentially important, and in any event, it ought to be said that one ought not read the Constitution to read a constitutional amendment as being unconstitutional. Uh, uh, I mean, the very notion <clears throat> that, that a constitutional amendment, therefore part of the Constitution, should be viewed as unconstitutional because of another part, a pre-existing part uh, of the Constitution uh, was uh, troubling to us, troubling in the sense we thought the argument might be made and significant because we thought it was important to answer it before uh, it was made. Um, uh, there was, uh, I speak for myself only here, uh, a, a level of intellectual tension, not amongst the people that joined, but at least in my mind about just how far we would go with the argument. I mean, were we going to say that <clears throat> the application of a constitutional amendment can never be unconstitutional? Professor Tribe himself, one of the drafts people of, of our brief, uh, had written that if there were a constitutional amendment saying that we'll no longer have a Republican form of government, that, that the court would have to deal with that in some way uh, and that it would uh, you know, not suffice. Therefore, it might not suffice. Therefore, in this case of such significance uh, to, to leave it unsaid that certainly the rule, the presumption, the way the constitution should be read uh, is that a constitutional amendment except in the most extraordinary circumstances, such as I, I just posited, by its nature, by, by its very nature, cannot be deemed unconstitutional. Um, um, and uh, we did make uh, that argument. <clears throat> uh, I think it was uh, important to make and to flesh out in so many words that what the other side was saying, what, what the defendant, uh, was, was saying was in essence that, that a constitutional amendment could not be enforced uh, uh, in circumstances uh, like this. And so the, the purport and the reason I would say for the brief was to make clear that, that the amendment was valid, enforceable and applicable. Thank you so much, Floyd. Uh, that was incredibly helpful. Um, I, another concern that has been raised both in this, in this litigation and then more broadly is uh, the concern that somehow 14.3 accountability will be weaponized uh, to unfairly uh, target the participation of officials in legitimate First Amendment protected uh, political expression. And conservatives have on more than one occasion and, and in incredibly ugly ways, um, attempted to draw a false equivalency between uh, individuals and officials who participated in the January 6th uh, insurrection and uh, officials who participated in the Black Lives Matter protests across our nation. And uh, Professor Gibson Rankin, uh, the, the brief that you filed in the New Mexico case, uh, you know, again, addresses this head on. And so if you could tell folks a little bit about that brief, that would be super helpful. Yes, thank you. No, I and this this work was created in large part with a brief drafted by Bert um, Rublin of Spare um, in Philadelphia, and because of the the really forward movement of the NAACP New Mexico and the NAACP Otero Branch chapter, 
um, I branch, I think there's just something very powerful about what they were addressing. And, and you're right, they did also talk about some of the First Amendment concerns that were raised in the other briefs. But what really was so powerful about the NAACP's brief that was captured by, by Judge Matthews and his, his um, opinion is noting that there it was a false equivalency. It was absolutely a false equivalency that had been established at a, through a number of courts that had already been addressing this point. Um, there is a distinction between elected officials who are engaged in ensuring that there are constitutional rights being followed um, as it related to Black Lives Matter. Just so everyone is aware, Black Lives Matter was addressing at that time the the in the summer of 2020, the murder of George Floyd. And it was directly dealing with police brutality against an unarmed black man. And the understanding that his constitutional rights had been violated, his, his right to be in the public square had been violated is very, very different than individuals who are engaged in attempts to overthrow the government and to ensure that constitutional Right, that the constitutional process did not proceed forward. So that's something that really stood out to Judge Matthews, and that Judge Matthews, and that was something that was in the brief. The other component that really um, captured Judge Matthews' attention and also was included in the brief related to this concern that this disenfranchisement, that by efforts to ensure that um, that Mr. Griffin was just there to ensure that his voters wouldn't be disenfranchised. Um, for the people that had voted him into office. And Judge Matthew was also not moved by this argument, um, noting that the NAACP also pointed out that the core mission of our, the 113 year existence organization has been related to ensuring that there was not voter disenfranchisement. And it's an odd argument that was raised because Mr. Griffin's sole purpose was to ensure all of the votes casted on behalf of what, who is now President Biden would be not viewed or not taken into account. So these are two things that really stood out in the NAACP's brief that Judge Matthew did include in his final opinion. Thank you so much. So I think I'm going to move us into a little bit of a moderated conversation. So it could be a little bit more interactive and it's going to be a mix of sort of um, a more high level of generality, and then also just practical things about the various different ways in which 14.3 uh, accountability is being played out, not only in courts, but also uh, through legislatures, both uh, federal legislation and state legislation that's being proposed. Uh, I'm going to start with something uh, that Professor Malioka has sort of, I guess, worried about professionally uh, in, in his scholarship and certainly has been uh, something the Constitutional Accountability has, uh, Center has, has thought about is that in the wake of the Civil War, um, a lot of the promise of the Reconstruction Amendments was quickly stamped out um, uh, by a series of restrictive uh, court rulings, Supreme Court rulings. And the Supreme Court, of course, has not interpreted Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. And one of the things I know you've worried about, uh, Professor Malioka, and I'd love you to just mention a little bit more about that, is some of the concerns you have that uh, the mistakes of the late 1800s um, as uh, as the Supreme Court started to interpret uh, the Reconstruction Amendments might be replicated as the Supreme Court uh, potentially does for the first time uh, interpret uh, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. In particular, you talk a little bit about a democracy uh, canon that you worry about uh, sort of leading to an unfairly pinched reading of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Right. Well, let's start by saying kind of more bluntly, this is about Trump, right? And and the most likely Supreme Court case about Section 3 would be cases involving Trump, assuming they get there in time. Um, now, you know, when you talk to people about January 6th and former President Trump, usually by the end of the conversation, I, I get somewhere to this point, someone says, yeah, I agree that he violated Section Three of the Fourteenth Amendment and should be dis and you know is subject to disqualification. But gee, wouldn't that be bad? Because then you're disenfranchising the people who want to vote for him. And so, shouldn't we just you know let him run? Because he probably won't win, and that's that. That takes care of the problem. Okay. 
So, um, you know, one thing to think about there is, of course, you can always make an argument for construing the 14th Amendment narrowly, right, in the name of something that you think important. Now, in the late 19th century, the answer to that was states' rights were important, right? So that's the reason why we want to construe the 14th Amendment narrowly, because, well, we don't want to unduly interfere in the internal affairs of the states, and we don't want Congress becoming the super legislature for America, and all of that. So that was the reason that was given then. And today, you could have a kind of different reason, that is, let people just vote, and that then that's all there is. Now, the trouble with that is, neither of those was an accurate interpretation of the 14th Amendment itself, right? The 14th Amendment was not about states' rights. It was about limiting states' rights. So it's just a wrong framework. And disqualification from serving in office is a denial of democracy, okay? In the same way that saying you can't, you couldn't vote for Barack Obama for a third term, you know, no matter how much you wanted to, that was a denial of democracy. So the point is that I, I think a job for litigation, especially in, in that instance, though, I mean, Coy Griffin also made some of these sorts of arguments. I was elected, and so you should respect the wishes of the voters by not kicking me out of office before my term ends. Um, th there's going to be this sort of education necessary to explain to people on the bench why, one, the proper interpretation of Section 3 doesn't mean you just sort of nullify it by letting it all be decided by the voters. And secondly, that, uh, look, you know, life will go on if somebody is disqualified. You know, there's another county commissioner in Otero County now, and you know, life's gone on. So it, it isn't sort of the end of the world. And the same is true, by the way, for allowing this case to go forward. We had, as you mentioned, the cases involving Congresswoman Taylor Greene and former Congressman Cawthorn. Okay, they were adjudicated, the sky didn't fall, and you know, the same would be true if there were cases about Donald Trump or anyone else. So I, because this is all unfamiliar territory, right, it's going to take some work to explain this and, and persuade that this is not just some uh, kind of uh, obscure provision that is being thrown out there for no particular reason. Uh, actually, the reasons for its ratification are very much connected to the reasons for its enforcement in the wake of January 6th. So helpful. Does anyone else want to chime in on that answer before I move to another question? This is the interactive part. Yeah, Professor Gibson. So I, I, I think... Um... Professor had a wonderful response. And, and I think that's also something that stood out to me is this distinction between this right to candidacy versus the rights of a voter, right? And, and this understanding that, you know, that candidacy itself is not a fundamental constitutional right. We do have, as, as he rightly pointed out, all these restrictions and these burdens that we put on the candidates. And this is something that had been included in um, a case that, that we ended up citing really points out that we can have a heavier burden on our candidates and we can use the system appropriately. I think that um, I, I would agree wholeheartedly that some you'll win, some you'll lose, but we should use the system as the way to get to the outcomes um, and decide and therefore know what is the, our, our practice to follow. Could I just add that that I think we have to recognize that if we're talking about Trump, for whom 75 million people voted, uh, it's going to be, a, I mean, a big deal, big deal. Uh, there'll be a lot of, you're denying the public exactly what, what you're saying. You're, 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 yeah, the public should have the chance to vote. Let the, let the people decide. And it's a violation of democratic principles. And I, th I think it, it will fall to, in more than the usual way, to academics, uh, to scholars, to people who have some idea what, what the 14th Amendment and Section 3 mean, why we have it, and why it's important that it be enforced, 
uh, as a as an answer to to try to persuade people that this is not just a behind our back way of getting rid of the guy they like. Uh, right, and perhaps articulating why, in fact, this mechanism is in fact a democracy strengthening mechanism uh, rather than an anti-democratic mechanism. And so contrary to sort of the way, the simplistic ways in which a lot of people have talked about it, uh, it, it is in fact a democracy strengthening uh, mechanism, uh, much as uh, many of the rules of candidacy have at least by design uh, been established to do. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about, you know, obviously Cruz landmark case uh, uh, and the ways in which this has been adjudicated through those challenges. There has been some conversation about 14.3 um, uh, accountability through legislatures, et cetera. It is at least um, theoretically possible since 14.3 uh, is very specific. Section three of the 14th Amendment is very specific about what needs to be done to remove a disqualification, right? Congress plays a role in removing a disqualification by a specified supermajority vote. So there's a lot of granularity about what and who removes a disqualification. But by design, there's more open language about who enforces uh, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, and it's open-ended on the process that can happen. Uh, Nikhil has mentioned, obviously, uh, the Colorado challenge in New Mexico. There were voter challenges through other mechanisms in, in, um, in North Carolina and in Georgia. It's at least possible that you could have something like a joint resolution, for instance, about President Trump that goes through uh, Congress uh, that I guess uh, establishes that he has violated uh, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Um, what do you say about some of these other fora through which 14.3 uh, can 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 operate? What do you think, for instance, about the, the legislative uh, the legislative form, federal legislation? Joint resolution, perhaps. Sure, I, I'll chime in here. Uh, I, I guess it's helpful to start by sort of emphasizing that federal legislation would not be necessary to enforce Section 3. Uh, the history of the amendment shows uh, that Section 3 can be enforced in the state courts. Okay. Uh, there was precedent from the Reconstruction era uh, confirming that. Uh, and the mechanism for enforcing it was state law, not federal law. Uh, in, in some of those instances, uh, the enforcement action was taken before Congress had actually passed any federal enforcement legislation. And so the the entirety of the challenge was brought under the auspices of state law uh, to enforce Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. In addition, there is a precedent uh, for uh, Congress and uh, the Senate to exclude individuals who are disqualified under Section 3 uh, through whatever processes that legislatures have in place to do so uh, to enforce uh, other qualifications uh, for office and other uh, uh, restrictions on the ability who can, who can be seated. Um, in terms of whether federal legislation would be helpful, I think what we have seen uh, already are that there are a num there were a number of actions taken by the Congress by both houses of Congress in a bipartisan manner that has recognized that the January 6th attack was an insurrection. Uh, you had bipartisan majorities of both houses of Congress uh, confirming that during uh, Mr. Uh, former President Trump's uh, second impeachment proceeding. Uh, you also had Congress voting on a number of uh, pieces of legislation uh, honoring those who defended the Capitol, uh, in which again, they, the Congress recognized that the event was an insurrection. Um, in terms of whether a formal declaration is is necessary, I'm not sure that it would necessary be necessary, but it certainly couldn't hurt. Uh, in terms of uh, sort of Congress proactively declaring that a particular person is uh, disqualified, um, my one hesitation there is that I think that there has to be some level of process for a person uh, to be uh, to be afforded before they are a judge disqualified. Uh, our, our view is that the state court mechanisms that we have invoked uh, and that uh, intend to, we intend to evoke in the, in the future do provide the necessary level of process for the person to come in and answer the charges against them. And we think that is necessary uh, to have uh, a fair adjudication of the issues. Uh, so uh, I, that is the one sort of caveat I would add to that sort of federal legislation. Uh, but uh, again, I just want to sort of stress that uh, the ability of state courts to do this on their own, uh, as the law currently exists, is uh, is is uh, well established. And and ought we not be 
concerned that if we try or if there is an effort to get Congress to do it and it fails, that that will be used against us before judges in sort of by you know the people who are on that side to sort of warn them off. Uh, you know, it's one thing for you to make a juridical decision, but but to do it in an area in which so the argument will go. Congress has already determined not to take any action. It might be not be stronger leaving it to the courts uh, without going, trying to go through Congress first, unless we have a, a, a genuine confidence that we, we would succeed. Yeah, I would just add that if Congress had done something, the, the advantage would have been primarily procedural. That is, there could have been a streamlined process to go to a three judge panel and then directly to the Supreme Court and get a particular challenge resolved. As it is, we have to rely on state law and state law is kind of all over the place in terms of, can you bring a challenge? When can you bring a challenge? How promptly will it get resolved? So that's gonna be difficult to sort of sort through as the year goes on. I would also be wary of approaching our current makeup of Congress on this. I think we heard some of this language right after January 6th, even from, from di different parts of the aisle saying, how can we move on from this? Um, I, I think what um, Mr. Abrams said is really resonating with me that we need to go back to some basic, what is the benefit of democracy rhetoric, education of the populace of the community before we would attempt anything at the federal level to say, so what does it mean to defend democracy by the people who are elected in this very room? And I also think it's gonna be a little tough to get some of them to vote against the likelihood that they might engage in some of this behavior again in the future. Well, that's super useful. And do folks feel similarly about state attempts? So, you know, we've addressed federal legislation, but there are some states, Virginia and, and New York, for instance, who have attempted to pass legislation that say, if you have been convicted of certain things like insurrection, you are not eligible to be on the ballot. And so, and this I think is trying to get at the fact that there have been some 900 people who have been prosecuted for January 6th related uh, activity. And I think roughly half of those individuals have either been found or have pled guilty already. And so there is going to be a body of people who've actually gone through various different processes and had their, had their as, as Nick Hill said, process rights uh, adjudicated and have been adjudicated guilty of something insurrection related. And what do you feel about state? Do you, do you have similar concerns about state legislation or not so much? So Praveena, I view those bills, uh, which, which Crew has uh, endorsed um, in both states um, as supplementing section three uh, and doing so in a way that is sort of firmly within the state's uh, wheelhouse in terms of the conduct and the officials that they are able to regulate. Uh, if the states determine that uh, individuals convicted of certain offenses after, as you mentioned, the appropriate level of process uh, shouldn't be able to hold office in their state, that is entirely their prerogative to act or enact a law uh, uh, on those terms. And uh, if the state determines that that, that is uh, beneficial for democracy in that state, uh, then you know we are certainly on board with that. And we defer to the judgment on the ground uh, by the folks in those states as to whether that is something that they want to do. Uh, but uh, again, uh, we view those bills as really uh, consistent with the goals and motivations underlying Section 3, but also uh, more of a, as a supplement rather than uh, an enforcement mechanism for uh, Section 3. For sure. And it's a, it's a supplement that addresses a subset of individuals who would have been addressed by Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, right? Because there's nothing in the text and history of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment that requires a criminal conviction, right? So this would be a subset of individuals who've gone through the, the, the criminal system and then, um, you know, had, had their rights adjudicated. Um, I, we have almost uh, no time uh, before we go to Q&A, and I want to give people Q&A time, but one thing to think about is, uh, what about factual sort of predicates that have already been built up? 
that might not have then had a section 14.3 part, but so Nikhil mentioned, for instance, the uh, second impeachment uh, uh, you know, proceedings against President Trump, which of course had to do with 14.3, uh, but there were also the, the nine hearings and countless documents and sort of heavy, heavy factual predicate that was developed by the select committee uh, to investigate January 6th attack on the US Capitol. And we have a 600 page report of evidence uh, dealing with President Trump and other lawmakers, some of whom have actually been the subject of criminal referrals in that report to DOJ. Um, can I ask you a quick question about what you think can be done with that factual predicate in the variety of different foras that are, you know can either state, et cetera? It seems to me that this report is sitting out there and how does that interact? Because 14.3 was mentioned in, Finding four of the of the final report. Well, I, I can just chime in briefly and say, of course, there is the possibility of criminal indictments being brought either by the Justice Department or by state prosecutors, right? And the, the fact of an indictment would tend to give credibility to a Section 3 disqualification suit against the indicted individual. Um, even if it's not strictly relevant, it, it just probably improves the sort of uh, atmospherics, we'll call it, of, of, of such a disqualification case. Uh, so that's out there. And then, of course, some individuals are referenced in the report that I'm sure people are looking at as to whether disqualification action might be possible. And, and I yes, agree it, that that okay. would be useful. That would be useful. Uh, in a disqualification proceeding to, to cite two relevant portions of the January 6th findings, for example. Uh, I mean, and, and I think that to, to come back to my, my uh, problem I asserted earlier, I don't think the fact that, you know, some people could use January 6th and other people couldn't because they didn't deal with this or they didn't reach that conclusion uh, is leads me to think that we ought not to even urge people to use it. I mean, it, it is, it's a serious document which reached important conclusions. And while the answer I know would be politicized, uh, it, it is something I think which has a, a clarity and a distinction which, which makes it valuable uh, in later proceedings. Right, and, and just to tie that to the sort of the section three disqualification cases, there is some very compelling evidence uh, in the report and supporting materials uh, that would establish and help establish that January 6th was an insurrection uh, and that uh, certain public officials engaged in it uh, and sort of whether it will be usable in proceedings will de depend on the evidentiary rules and the relevant jurisdictions, but I, I think you can certainly expect that it will come up as a very key piece of evidence. Uh, and you are already seeing in uh, federal courts in DC, uh, in the criminal prosecutions uh, arising out of January 6th, there have been a number of courts that have taken judicial notice of the uh, background facts in the report, which in and of itself is uh, highly valuable. And so I think that you, you, you can expect to see a similar use of that in court proceedings going forward. I just wanted to add, and I know we're gonna go to hear from our, our attendees, but right now I think we all have a shared sense of what insurrection means, what it feels like to us. But we wanna remember through history even efforts to fight against slavery were considered insurrectionists, right? People who were fighting against the Fugitive Slave Act were considered to be insurrectionists. And so I, I'm getting a little anxious, and I didn't think I would, on this notion that we might have a shared definition, but I believe state by state, as we're watching some of the laws that are coming down related to reproductive rights, some of the rules coming down about critical race theory or so-called in, in education, issues related to um, gender affirming for young children. I, I worry that there could be some efforts in various states to make certain behaviors fall within the category of insurrection, thereby 
um, when we look back on this in history in another 100 years, we'll say, oh, we may have locked it in a little too tightly. Um, and so we'll need some more clarifying definitions of what counts as behavior that is not in furtherance of the best interests of this nation. Thank you. I'm gonna take uh, some questions but because they've suddenly been flooding in. Um, uh, a question for Floyd Abrams. Um, while a constitutional amendment cannot be unconstitutional, could an act of Congress implementing such an amendment be challenged as a violation of the First Amendment? Yes. Uh, I mean, I, I could conceive of it. Uh, nothing's easier than positing unconstitutional statutes. Uh, and, and I'm sure that the, our members of Congress can come up with one, which, which would indeed violate the First Amendment and do so in the name of implementation uh, of, of the pre-existing uh, uh, Constitution. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a thought which will occur. I, I mean, I think it's a genuine, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not a hypothetical uh, uh, situation. I wouldn't be surprised at all if that happened. Um, does that, if nobody wants to add something to that, I'm going to go to the next question. In the past decade, both the Ninth and Tenth Circuits, the latter in a decision written by then Judge Gorsuch, have upheld secretaries of state that excluded presidential candidates from state primary ballots for failure to meet other constitutional requirements for the presidency, specifically age and natural born citizenship. Assuming that the state system includes some form of process, either preliminary or following the Secretary of State's decision, so a candidate can be heard and present evidence in his favor, is there any reason that Secretaries of State should not be able to exclude someone like Trump as ineligible on the basis of engagement and insurrection, just as we know that they can when somebody is ineligible on the basis of age or birthplace? Well, so the answer is, yes, they can, if state law permits them to make that determination. Now, in some states, for example, primary elections are entirely run by the party. So there's no involvement of the Secretary of State at all. In other states, only a judicial challenge can be brought. The Secretary of State plays kind of just a ministerial role, right? But there are states in which the Secretary of State must make a determination that someone is eligible or can exclude someone as ineligible. Colorado is an example. So uh, that can be done in some states. So yeah, and, and accepting the premise, uh, assuming that state law allows the Secretary of State to uh, exclude a constitutionally disqualified candidate, if the question is whether they should, uh, I guess I would reframe the question uh, is, as whether Secretaries of State should ignore the Constitution of the United States. And my answer is no. They should apply the Constitution. They take an oath to uphold it. Uh, and if state law gives a mechanism to uh, apply it, then they, they can't ignore it. They are required to uh, to apply it. And then, of course, there, there will be litigation around that. And that is something that everyone sort of anticipates. But the notion that a state officer that is charged with sort of policing the ballot uh, as those decisions from the Ninth Circuit and the Tenth Circuit recognize – uh, states have a compelling interest in doing uh, can simply disregard a constitutional qualification because it might not be good uh, policy or might be politically fraught is is untenable in, in my view. Fantastic. Um, uh, I'm going to combine these two questions because we're running short of time. So given that Trump has declared his candidacy and uh, and uh, the election is looming, what might be a proposed timeline? of 14.3 litigation. And separately, if some states disqualify and some don't, what does that mean for a federal election? Well, I would defer a little bit to Nick on the timeline of things, but basically the timeline begins when Trump officially submits his fee, entry fee and signatures and whatever else state law requires to be a candidate on the primary ballot. And that's not gonna fall until probably the end of the year. Uh, so prior to that, the, the case simply wouldn't be right. Uh, now, um, well, 
I mean, that's 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 basically the answer on that. Uh, I can't remember. I'm sorry, I lost the second part of the second part of the question. <laughs> Yeah, I think oh. the, the question is on timing and then as well uh, on the fact that if a candidate, a federal candidate is disqualified in some states and not others. Uh, oh, right. You know, okay. So, yeah. And that's basically untenable. I mean, the Supreme Court is going to have to weigh in. I mean, it, it seems to me that uh, so long as one state declares Trump disqualified, then the Supreme Court is going to have to weigh in because a national election really can't proceed, you know, unless you're talking about 1860, where Lincoln wasn't allowed to run in the South, uh, you, you can't have a presidential election where the major party candidate or a major candidate for a nomination even, you know, is only allowed on the ballot in some states and not others. Got it. Does some, anyone else want to join in on that? Or I'm going to go to the next question. Well, I'm just thinking of how Justice Alito would view it. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I, I think your answer is correct. Um, and and I think that I think they might even get there for the very reason that you said. I mean, it's an apolitical reason, uh, an apartisan reason, and uh, you know the the idea of a candidate for president being thrown off the ballot in one state, eight states, whatever. Uh, at least the court would would take a case. I agree take a case and decide uh, whether uh, that is or is not uh, a violation uh, of the, the public's right or couch it as, as, as you will. But I, I, I agree that we, we, we would not go ahead with an election uh, in which a, a candidate, one candidate was barred without at least in one state without at least a Supreme Court review as to just what the powers are of the state officials with respect to federal elections. And there's a question about the Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, um, challenge in Georgia. Uh, does anyone want to comment on why it was that she was found to not have engaged in insurrection? Or to explain that? Well, my answer to that would be that uh, the challengers weren't allowed any discovery. So it made it very difficult, since they had the burden of proof, to show that she was, in fact, involved to the degree necessary to prove, disqualif to prove engagement under the language of Section 3. So without, without discovery, it's a, it's a little hard to make your case. Right. Also, there was a significant amount of conduct before she took her first oath of office that simply was outside of the scope of the case because it wasn't part of the section. It couldn't have been part of the Section 3 case. Uh, section 3 only comes into uh, kicks into gear once you take a qualifying oath in a covered office. Uh, so uh, I think that's a significant part of it as well. But as Gerard mentioned, the, the uh, free speech for people did not get discovery in that case. And the hearing that uh, that we watched was actually a live deposition taking place rather than uh, a, uh, a a sort of full-on trial where they had had the opportunity for discovery in a deposition prior to the hearing. Uh, another question for uh, Floyd Abrams. Um, uh, what do you say to talking points that defamation and fighting words aren't covered in the First Amendment? Are they covered in the First Amendment and what is the truth behind um, defamation by Rudy Giuliani and the former, uh, you know what, I think I'm going to, I'm not sure I understand the second part of this. Um, what do you say to talking points that defamation and fighting words aren't covered in the First Amendment? Aren't protected, I take it the question. I mean, yeah, I think that's what, I, yeah, yeah. sorry, I'm just paraphrasing. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, I, I think that that um, that ruling and, and and others attendant to it are unlikely to survive uh, Supreme Court review at this time. Uh, I don't think we're going to. Uh, I don't think this court would uh, allow. I have to use the word like much in the way of regulation or punishment or whatever 
um, uh, of most of the aggravating language which comes up in fighting words cases. Now, I suppose, you know, what one can conjure up uh, out of reality, you know, some of the language used, which might, which may be so threatening in some way that, that there might be a different rule. But I think we're moving away from, uh, we're moving towards uh, a less restrictive, uh, more open, and in its way more dangerous, but but uh, uh, we're, we're, we're moving towards uh, more rather than less speech of that sort being held constitutionally protected. Uh, the worst part of my job is drawing a conversation like this to a close because there is no natural close when uh, when I have the delight and, and honor to, to speak with four experts on this topic. Um, but uh, the ACS folks are telling me to do exactly that. Um, it, it has been such a pleasure to be in conversation with you. And this is certainly a continuing conversation and is going to continue to be relevant uh, in, in the days, months, and uh, years to come. So Thank you very much. Thank you to uh, Professor Sonia Gibson Rankin, Professor Gerard Malioka, uh, Floyd Abrams, and Nikhil Suss for your time, your expertise, and for sharing both of those uh, with us. Thank you also to ACS, uh, Doris Shang, uh, Valerie Nannery, and Lindsay Lanholz for uh, organizing this. And thanks to everybody who attended today.